This program was made possible in part by funding from Entergy, supporting the future of our communities through investments in early childhood education. Information available at Entergy.com. Entergy, together we power life. This program is part of American Graduate. Let's make it happen. A public media initiative made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and from viewers like you. and welcome to a special Town Hall edition of Louisiana Public Square. I'm Shauna Sanford, co-anchor of Louisiana The State We're In. And I'm Beth Courtney, President and CEO of Louisiana Public Broadcasting. We thank the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts in New Orleans for hosting our broadcast tonight. And we also welcome those watching at statewide viewing parties coordinated by Ready Louisiana. Well, you know, Shauna, the first few years of life are key to brain development. Early childhood care is also essential to keep the parents of young children in the workforce. And tonight, we'll discuss the challenges of fulfilling those policy ideals for every child and parent. That's right, Beth. Over the next hour, we'll hear from advocates, providers, parents, and pediatricians. We'll discuss the importance of quality care in early life while trying to parse out the political hurdles in funding the future early childhood opportunities. Rin Kellick and his classmates look forward to recess for one reason, to play with their class dog, the toy dog Oscar. Rin attends Prep Center in Bastrop, Louisiana with his twin brother Ward. It's a highly rated early childhood education center with a mission to teach what they call the whole child. That means preparing children academically for kindergarten as well as emotionally and socially. Lois Jordan is the director of the Prep Center. Each age group has a curriculum and they have lesson plans. They have a goal that teaching is intentional here, that at each age and stage that there's a benchmark we want to see them make. There's just a great opportunity to teach and expose them to math, to science, to music, to large motor, to small motor play every day. We teach with intention. Melanie Broadfin is an early childhood education advocate and executive director of the Policy Institute for Children. Fifteen years ago, we thought this time of life was babysitting. Any 15-year-old can do it. Now, it's like one of those times that research has turned what we thought on its head. It's exactly the opposite. In fact, it's the most important time of life for brain development. Dr. Charles Zena is a child psychiatrist with Tulane Medical Center. He says the years zero to five are crucial for academics and social skills. What this is about is really what kind of a developmental trajectory the child is on. And children who have high quality child care tend to be on healthy developmental trajectories and children who have low quality, poor child care tend to be on more problematic trajectories. Across the disciplines of science, neuroscience, child development, and even economics shows like the rate of return of, that, of investing one dollar in that time of life is so huge because you're building the foundation for everything else to follow. Louisiana has done some work to align policy with science. A law called Act 3 was an element of the education policy overhaul of 2012. Bronfen says the years 0 to 4 were already underfunded by the state. What this did was it raised standards and it created an accountability system where all these programs would be compared to each other with the same standards, but it didn't raise funding of any of the programs. So the challenge is here's child care assistance being funded a teeny percentage of what pre-K is funded, but now they're supposed to meet the same standards, and Act 3 did nothing to raise funding for any of the programs. The West Feliciana Parish School System houses what some call a model for early childhood education. Hollis Milton is the district superintendent. We would rather spend more money on programs in early childhood 
than programs of remediation at the, at the later grades. And so you're going to do one or the other. You're either going to pay now or you're going to pay later. First graders test above average in the state for reading. The district's ACT score has been higher than the state average for years. The program could not be immediately duplicated anywhere. It has been around in some form since the late 1980s. The system is very small and it is well funded. But Milton says schools across the state can learn from their program. I don't believe that you can get to where West Feliciana is overnight, but I think um, you can take major steps every year toward moving that. It will take prioritizing and reallocating current resources, Milton says. The money is already being spent. Uh, you have parents spending uh, money for, for daycare programs. You have us expanding and building many times more prison facilities. You have unemployment rates that seem to be problematic for a state that has jobs that people don't have the skills for. Early childhood programs, of course, benefit the state's economy because they promote education, but they can help the workforce in another way. Parents often rely on outside care so they can continue working when their children are young. Wren and Ward's mother, Bailey Kellick, says Prep Center has allowed her to get back to work. The first six months uh, when my boys were born, uh, I actually had to quit work. And I had stopped working because it was taking all my paychecks to um, pay for daycare. So I wasn't able to do that. So I stayed at home and um, had to you know, rely on everyone else in my life. And now I'm more independent. Kellick says now she depends on government assistance to help pay for tuition. If I did not get child care assistance, my kids would be at home and so would I. Parents pay a lot for a highly rated center, comparable to a college education, Jordan says. Young families have the biggest expense at the youngest of their age and the less money they're probably ever going to make in their career. So I've often said we need tops for tots. Funds are available through the Child Care Assistance Program, or CCAP. Over the last five years, funding for the program has decreased 60 percent, and the number of children served has been cut in half. Due to funding limitations, the Department of Education estimates about 150,000 at-risk children are not being served. Another state program to help with funding is the School Readiness Tax Credit. It has many facets. Parents can get a credit on their taxes if they send their children to a high-quality center. Centers get a bonus if they maintain or improve high ratings. Teachers can get credit if they seek further education. Jordan says it has helped tremendously. Who was the beneficiary? The children. And now those children have moved on to kindergarten ready to learn. But Bronfen and Jordan agree that these funding mechanisms aren't enough. Each of the gubernatorial candidates has recognized the importance of early childhood education, but the state's fiscal reality keeps options limited. And many thanks to our parents and our providers for sharing their experiences. I know everyone is eager to get our discussion started, our audience and our great panel. We're really talking tonight about the need for better funded care and the obstacles in securing that funding, especially the obstacles that our legislators face. And no one knows that uh, better than our first guest tonight, Representative Walt Leger, who is from the New Orleans area. He is Speaker Pro Tem of the Louisiana House of Representatives and is an advocate for early child childhood policies in the legislature. Seated next to him is Christy Reddick Givens. She's the owner and director of Kids of Excellence, a child care center in New Orleans. She is a 16-year veteran of the child care industry. Derek Little is the deputy director of early childhood education at the Department of Education, where he leads policy planning for funding, accountability, enrollment, and governance of early childhood programs. Teresa Falgust is program coordinator of Kids Count. As part Part of its agenda for children, it collects data including economic security, education, criminal justice, and health. And Dr. Stuart Gordon worked as Chief of Pediatrics at Earl K. Long Medical Center in Baton Rouge for 18 years. He is an advocate for the children's health issues, focusing on early brain and child development. Welcome all of you to the program tonight. And before we take questions from our audience, I know that Beth has a question for our panel to get the discussion started. Well, I Beth. do indeed. Thank Thank you, Shauna. And uh, I guess a kickoff question to all of you from your perspective, what do you think is the biggest obstacle 
to really high quality uh, child care for the people of Louisiana. And Walt, I'm going to begin with you. <laughs> I think that one of the biggest obstacles is public awareness. So this event tonight will help us move the ball down the field a little bit uh, as it relates to this really important policy area. But clearly our structural budget deficits that we have seen year after year continue to be an obstacle to, to funding both child care and uh, the LA4 program. The fact that over the course of the last six years we've reduced um, funding um, by 60 percent has been very detrimental to our ability to fund and the fact that we've moved federal dollars in the TANF program uh, away from funding uh, early child care operations, uh, those obstacles have to be reversed in order us, for us to move forward. Well, so that's a big order, but uh, from the perspective of somebody's delivering it, what, what do you think is the biggest obstacle? Well, as a child care provider and been doing this for 16 years, the biggest uh, obstacle is funding. I mean, it's funding and also our biggest obstacle is retaining our staff. You know, because we, not, we don't have enough funding to provide them with the type of living wages that they need. And we work, you know, and we may have staff for two and three years. We train them, but we can't afford to increase their pay. So they move on to the school system or move on to other programs that probably can afford them. And that really hurts the childcare industry because it's like we keep starting over and over and over. But if we had the funding in place, my staff, they've been with me. I have some staff has been with me over 10 years. There's some staff that come to me and give me their notice. They love Kids of Excellence. They want to be there, but they have families. They have responsibilities. And with lack of funding, they have to move on to other places. Well, Derek, is there a policy obstacle as well? Uh, th first, thank you for having us and thank you for this discussion and as Walt said, sort of elevating it uh, more broadly in the state. I think there are several things that are, are happening really well right now in the state regarding early childhood, but there are a few things which still are very difficult. Uh, the first is the state as a whole, when we just look at state investment in early childhood, is very small. So much of what we're doing is supported through federal dollars. So when we think about expansion and increasing access to children, that is a hurdle that we have to, to figure out a way to cross. Uh, and that relates directly to what Christy just said, which I think we would definitely add to one of the top things that we've got to work through as a state, which is how do we provide you know, adequate and quality compensation to teachers who are doing this work, particularly in childcare settings where so often they're paid at or just above minimum wage. Uh, but our teachers that we're expecting to help children prepare to enter kindergarten. And those two together ultimately do relate to funding, but they bring a lot of other pieces of our early childhood policy puzzle together. Well, Teresa, certainly Kids Count shows us that we have sort of a difficult intransigent poverty as well, do we not? Yeah, unfortunately in Louisiana, 31% of children under the age of five are living in families in poverty. Um, and we see early childhood education as a really great strategy to prevent more children from growing up in poverty in the future and to ameliorate the effects of poverty now. Well, uh, Stuart, you, you see them as a pediatrician. What do you see as the biggest ob obstacle? Well, I think that the, the challenge, really the opportunity for us is for us to, and it, it goes along a lot with what the other panelists have said, is for everybody to understand the value of early economic investment in our greatest natural resource, which is the minds of our children. We have lots of economic development that takes place every day to create jobs, job programs, workforce development, but the single best place to start is early um, I mean, you can get into uh, supporting the health of the mother and the family prior to that child being born, but even um, depending on the circumstances of that individual, once that child gets here, 75 percent of their growth and development and the, the physical size of the brain, their growth and development lies ahead of them, regardless of how you get here, and so you still have so much opportunity afterwards. Um, it, it's hard for, as uh, I think Melanie said in the, in the previews, in the last 15, 20 years, you know, we've come to this understanding that there's so much really happening inside our children's brains. They're not just little lumps of clay. They are um, sponges for information. Their neurons are just starved to fill up with good experiences and good quality experiences in the best caregiver's hands and will all be better served if we invest on the front end instead of down the road on the back end.
Well, thank you all so much, and uh, over to you, Shauna. Thank you so much, and uh, we have a young person who's going to get our conversation started with our audience members tonight. We have Desmond, who's with the Legislative Youth Advisory Council. It's always great to have you all uh, join us for uh, our discussions here tonight. Desmond, tell us why this is of interest to you and, and what your question is for the panel. This topic is interesting to me because I've always been eager to know what legislators are deciding for my peers and I as involving education. And my question for you all is, what do you say to those critics who believe that it is the parent's responsibility to give the child the early stages of life of learning and not taxpayers? And why don't we start with you, Christy? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, well, I, I do believe that as a, a child care provider and also as a parent, I was a mother of three kids who had to attend early, my kids had to attend early childhood programs. And it was very expensive for me. For me, I was, you know, most of the time, and it's good people are being aware, and they kind of think that parents are just sitting home and they don't want the best for their kids. But I was in school, I was going to college, I was getting my bachelor's degree, and I got my master's degree. And I was working a full-time job. Mm -hmm. But with three kids, it was still impossible. It was very expensive for me to pay for childcare on my own. I had support for family, but majority of my family lived in poverty. So it wasn't as much money as they could give me. And I just didn't want my children to stay at home with family members who are not able to give them the quality of education that I wanted them to have. Because I wanted my kids to be ready for school. So I applied for programs and I was only able to get one of my kids in a Head Start program. And my other two kids had to sit at home because I couldn't afford childcare. And I saw the difference when my kids got older. My daughter who had that early beginning, she did well in school. She was, did very well. But my other kids, they had to wait to go to school, to kindergarten, and they, they struggled. They really did struggle. But, you know, I, were able to, I was able to pay for tutoring, you know, because I got a degree and I, I got more income, but most people are not able to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's our responsibility as a community to help support. And we all need to understand this is not just a parent responsibility, it's all our responsibility because we're all taxpayers, it even really the parents. It really does take a village, doesn't it? It really does take yes. a village. Teresa, maybe you could speak to that. You know, one thing that we've definitely learned over the past 20 years is that early, found, early experiences form the foundation for your lifelong success. So not only does it improve children's educational outcomes starting out early, but it also increases um, their lifetime earnings, reduces risk of coming into contact with the criminal justice system, and it actually has a very positive return on investment, better than many um, investments in the stock market even. So even if you don't care about kids at all, it's still a good investment. Mm -hmm. And I think we can all agree we <laughs> care about kids. So. Right, Representative Leger. Um, people are often told, invest your money early in the stock market and then allow interest to compound over the years so that it grows and grows and grows. Mm -hmm. And that way, over the course of uh, a lifetime, you have a nest egg to retire on. Well, it's exactly the same thing when it comes to investing in our children. And when you invest early in their life in the earliest developmental stages, the benefits of that compound over the years to the point where you're growing both the workforce of tomorrow and you're also uh, preparing our students to be a part of the global economy when they get out of school and pursue their dreams. Um, not to mention the fact that when you invest in early child care and child education, now you're helping the workforce of today. Because when mom and dad need to go to work, or mom and dad need to go to school, or mom and dad need to go to one of the highly funded community and technical college programs that the state has been investing in, then, they're, then they know that their child is in a quality setting where they're being prepared for their future. And they're also able to be more productive because they're secure that their children are getting the right application of skills necessary so that they can move forward uh, and be ready to, to compete. So I think um, the stock market is exactly the same thing. Invest early, invest often, and let the years uh, work for you. Thank you. Beth? Well, I'm here with Margaret Trahan, uh, CEO of the United Way of Acadiana. So what is your question for our panel? 
Well, you know, I think one of you said something about people seeing the value, if you will, of early childhood education and early care. How do we make that real for people? I mean, I, I've heard all of what you're saying about all the theory behind why it's important, but what happens when a child enters school and they are not prepared to learn? What are some of the kinds of things that a teacher or someone in the classroom sees from those children? Who wants to take that? Derek, do we have any data to show in, from the department? Absolutely. It's a, it's a great question. And I think uh, if you talk to a kindergarten teacher and you ask them, did this child attend pre-K or not, they can immediately tell you that, even on the first day. And a lot of that gets at the social and emotional development of those children, which are a, a real focus in the early childhood years. Uh, so to be specific to your question, it's simple things like, can the child follow directions? Can the child interact with peers without either having a meltdown in the class or, or fighting with another student? And those are important things which are gateways to, are we gonna be able to help this child grow and develop academically? Uh, but one of the, the points that I think is important to remember here is early childhood can not only improve that experience for the child and the teacher, but statewide it can drastically reduce the number of students that we retain in a grade level. In Louisiana, we typically see more than 2,000 kindergartners that repeat kindergarten. And if they had come through an early childhood program, particularly a quality one, that number alone will drop, which not only benefits those children because it moves them through the birth to 12 system on time, which has a lot of other benefits, but it saves the state a lot of money because we're paying collectively to educate those children twice in one year. Yeah. Anyone else want to weigh in on this one? Uh, I would say that right. it hasn't always been that the state funds public education in the way that we do now from K through 12. There was a time where uh, people didn't see value in, in kindergarten. And so I would, I would suggest that uh, the best way for us to prove value is to look at the dollars being spent because we're not making the early investment and put them up against the dollars um, in a way that allows you to compare it. So um, juvenile uh, incarceration, um, the cycle of poverty, um, the fact that our state leads the nation in violent crime. All of those three things are um, costing our state uh, close to a billion dollars a year that could be redirected and invested into our young people. I believe ultimately that what we ought to recognize is we invest between nine and twelve thousand dollars of taxpayer money for every student from K through 12. Why would we not make a commitment to invest at least that amount of money in our, in our children zero to four. Um, we value the other investment, we just need to get to a place where people can value the earlier investment. Thank you very much. And certainly accountability is though, is what we're talking about at all levels of education. So as well as that. All right, over to you, Shauna. Thank you very much. And I think many of you have said this is not just a family issue, but this is a workforce issue. It really is. And with me now is Jennifer Kazair. You're with Intergy. So tell us, why is this of interest to you and well, to Intergy? Available, uh, health, available child care is important to the business community because with working families can't work if there's not available child care. Mm -hmm. And high quality child care is even more important because you can't fully uh, be a worker and fully focus on your job if you're concerned about your, your child care arrangements. So our question to the panel is how can we collectively as the business community help you with your individual goals to bring quality child care to our community? Yes. Great question. And I think the first part of that is to understand this is for all of our children. So I think 70% of uh, children less than five years of age have at least one or two parents that are taking care of them in the workforce. So this isn't just about those people. This is about every child whose parent is working to make uh, a living and provide for them as a caregiver, provide them good health, good education, with the objective eventually of them getting to school ready to learn. So uh, the idea, you know, the more that uh, the business community can recognize that and businesses um, support the efforts maybe for those that can't fully afford their own uh, services, that's why this child care assistance is important so people can enter the workforce and be able to be healthy at work while their kids are healthy and well cared for. Um, and there's also some families that aren't going to be able to, I mean, there are going to be plenty of families that are going to be able to afford that. 
but there has to be a balance so that all children benefit from that early learning center that you know gets the child ready to learn. And it sounds like businesses are aware of this mm -hmm. and they want to do more, but maybe they just don't know where to go. They don't know what resources are available. Are there any incentives? What's happening at the state level, Representative Lynch? Well, so certainly the uh, school readiness tax credit is a, is a place to look uh, for state support uh, for businesses uh, to tap into uh, some incentives so that they can help their workers access high quality care. Um, I think we ought to thank Energy and we ought to thank other NGOs like United Way and other great businesses across the state who have made this a priority. Um, what we also ought to celebrate is one of the most exciting things happening in our state. There's some $75 billion worth of private investment being made between Lake Charles and New Orleans along our chemical corridor. There's a manufacturing renaissance that's happening um, that we haven't seen in generations with tens of thousands of jobs to follow. And so while the state continues to invest in training programs and other educational opportunities for grown-ups, we ought to also be recognizing that grown-ups need to take care of their, of their children at the same time. And so for the people of the state of Louisiana to, to reach their full potential and fill these tens of thousands of jobs, there simply has to be a high quality uh, early care and educational opportunity for all the children the businesses advocating for it and the state pushing for it as businesses continue to come in is really crucial. Yeah, Derek, I see you're shaking your head quite a bit to that. Yeah, I think the school readiness tax credits are a good way for businesses to have an incentive because businesses can make donations to quality rated child care centers and get a portion of that back. Businesses and individuals can make a donation to the regional child care support agencies, Agenda for Children is one, uh, and get that dollar for dollar back in terms of a credit. So I think those are, are real good ways that we currently have on the books for people to at least pay attention and, and help support this work. But the broader thing is I think making the conversation more of a focal point uh, with the folks that businesses interact with, which we may not have entree to uh, as policy makers, but you know, letting folks know of the importance to your workforce specifically mm -hmm. as a business and then more broadly to the workforce in the state can go a long way. Yeah, and the good news is that there is help out there. There are resources available. Yes. I want to add to that, and I do, uh, we have the tax credits, and the tax credit has been wonderful, but there have been a shift in the tax credits. I mean, when I first started and I came back after the hurricane, I opened in 2017, I made a decision and I committed to becoming a high-quality center. So when I first started, okay, I had, my capacity is 57 kids. I had 42 kids was on child care assistance. Once I increased my quality stars and became a four-star center, and in order to become a four-star center, I had to reduce my ratio. I had to reduce the classroom size. I had to hire highly qualified teachers to retain them, to keep them and give them benefits. But the kids, my vision, my mission, who I wanted to serve, I'm shifting from that because those families cannot afford me. So now I have just passed 2014, my tax credits, I only had eight kids on child care assistance. So a lot of the high quality programs do not have the children in their centers because it costs more. At my facility, it costs almost $700 a month to attend my facility. Wow. And when you have child care assistance, that's giving you 325 60 231 a 154 and the parent responsible for the other amount and the parents are making 8 or $9 an hour, they have to make a decision that they have to say, well, you know what, I have to put my child in a center that they don't have quality. Mm -hmm. And we're sitting up here and we're talking about brain development and all of these things and, you know, these things are not what's, what's happening right now. I mean, I can service more low-income kids now because I do have an Early Head Start grant. Mm -hmm. So I'm able to have that because they're giving me more money to be able to serve those kids. But the child care assistant kids and I, and I, I, I think the state is doing great. And I know there's increases coming to the child care center, but it's not enough. Yeah. We need more. We also have to make sure those tax credits stay and we also have to make sure those tax, tax credits increase. And we have to make sure that those kids are in the high quality programs. Those kids who need it, absolutely. Beth? Well, certainly all the tax credits are going to be under scrutiny as we go into special sessions with the new administration coming in. And you made a point about that. And I guess you haven't ultimately dis 
you have unintended consequences out of some of the plans. And so you have to constantly tweak, would, would be my thought about that. I have a mother here, Lacey, and she has a question for the panel. Lacey? Hi. As a mother of five, my youngest has been on a wait list at a high quality child care facility. Um, what needs to happen in Louisiana for families like mine to get the quality and affordable child care, you know, that their kids need? So you're on a wait list. There yes, aren't my enough. My youngest one is. I have five, but my others are in school. But my baby, she's been on a wait list for two years. So there are not enough slots. No. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. Suggestions? Yeah, absolutely. I can start uh, the response. I think there are two specific things that we need to do as a state. The first communities are working on right now, which is to better manage the enrollment process that you go through as an individual so that you're not on a wait list at one center and there are actually empty seats available at another quality center in the community. That type of communication and coordination has previously not existed and that is a centerpiece of what we're trying to achieve across the state as part of our early childhood initiatives. And we see community by community across Louisiana folks making good progress in that area. So first is better coordination, which will move folks around to where there are opportunities. The second is a, a real recognition that there aren't enough seats. Uh, we saw in the intro that child care assistance funding was cut by 60% and that the number of children that we're serving is down by 50 to 60%. So those children had to go somewhere or families like you are struggling to, to get into a center. Uh, we are doing a couple of things to try to help with that, part of which responds to what Christy just brought up. We are increasing the child care assistance rates starting at the, the turn of the calendar year. Uh, so we will reduce the financial burden on families and increase the financial support from the state directly to providers. That should help to some extent. Uh, it, it obviously doesn't create a lot of new seats, but it, it could help folks who are trying to access Child Care Center but are currently priced out. The other thing that I would mention is only for four-year-olds, but we were fortunate in Louisiana to win a federal grant to expand preschool, and we got just over $30 million for a four-year period to add ultimately almost 2,000 more seats throughout the state for four-year-olds specifically. So communities are, are doing that now in the first year, but we will see that opportunity expand statewide over the next three years. Well, Lacey says that she's talking about um, Head Start, and, and isn't that an interesting thing? I, I think there have been numbers of pilots where Head Start providers, child care folks, and LA4 are getting together for the very first time. Is that, is that true? That's Absolutely right, and Christy can speak to her experience in the pilot. Uh, Head Start is an interesting thing that you're talking about, and there are wait lists almost at every Head Start throughout this state. Uh, that is a program very similar to our LA4 program, which the state funds for preschool, where you get a set number of, of seats, and once you fill those, you basically are out of money. So the, the Head Starts work with the federal government to receive their funding. So for example, if they can serve 100 kids, they only have the funding to serve 100 kids. The 101st family has to go on a wait list. The same is actually true for our pre-K programs at the state level. Uh, we serve just over 16,000 statewide, but if we had 18,000 which ask, which typically is the case, we see 1,500 to 2,000 kids every year trying to go to a public school for pre-K and they can't because we don't have the funding right now to support that. So it's funding again. It's knowing where there's slots open, yes. communication, and um, thank you for your question. All right, to you, Shauna. Well, assisting families is something, something that the United Way is all about, and I'm joined now by Michael Williamson, who is the CEO president for United Way Southeast Louisiana. It's great to have you here tonight. Um, your question for our panel. First of all, I want to join the audience in thanking our panelists for, for being a part of this conversation and kind of raising up this issue, and, and specifically you all for being such a a champion for this work and, and my question is um, you know given the recent reforms we've seen in early care and education you know how can we ensure that we don't end up having more children under the age of four that are at risk ending up in lower quality settings which is something we were actually intending not to have so who wants to take that one first <laughs> I can so, take first crack yeah. at that. Or well, I, I, would, I would just say that Act 3, obviously, is a big step in the right direction. Certainly, I think, as we've worked with advocates <laughs> like your agency and so many others, 
to try to craft uh, what we would like to be a perfect early child care and education model, we've fallen far short. Um, one of the reasons why is because of funding, but also because of some structural things that we have to fix. And we've already spoken a little bit to the fact that um, we've wor we're working with federal grants. Uh, we're trying to bring together different sources of funding that previously had never been braided together to be able to meet the needs of children. Um, and, we're, and we're working to ensure that there are enough slots. Furthermore, uh, in 2014, um, we passed a House Concurrent Resolution 61 and, we're, and worked with the Department of Education to determine what did we need to make sure that we could have a system that would work. Um, they responded that, at, that we needed a minimum of $80 million uh, to get started and that, the, and that three of the major factors were, one, providing enough slots for kids. Two, making sure that every teacher in an LA4 program had at least a bachelor's degree. And then three, ensuring that every teacher in an early child care setting had at least an associate's degree. But we recognize that in order to do that, you've got to pay people a fair wage. And so we also know that by 2020, that amount's going to be close to $200 million. So um, we need to make a commitment to high quality, but we also have to recognize that it's going to take some time to build it from the ground up to ensure that we don't leave anybody behind. Can you give people just a little bit of the history of Act 3 for those who may not be very familiar? Sure. Derek, would you like to hit that? Or I mean, <laughs> Act 3 was a part of an of education reform package brought back in uh, 2012, and Act 3 was the early childhood education portion that basically was a commitment by the legislature passed unanimously um, with the hard work of many different advocates that says that said we would be committed as a state to making sure that every kid would be ready for kindergarten when they when they got there. School readiness is the goal mm -hmm. and there are many different tasks that, that that so many people have worked through to try to get us there but that's the history of, of Act 3 2012. Yes, Derek. Yeah, and I think the crux of it is the recognition that at the state level and the local level we should all be working together in a stronger way that you know across state agencies which have been involved in early childhood we need to coordinate and, and spend more of our time figuring out how we can maximize the resources that we have. At a local level it's created what we call community networks so that's a function of bringing child care, Head Start and public and non-public preschool programs together to try to work towards a consistent and common standard of quality to provide support to teachers in the classrooms where they need it and to address the question that we got earlier in working with families to enroll children in the easiest way because that system has been uh, incredibly complicated for, for many of our families. So it's the idea that by working together in a way that we haven't before in this state, uh, we can achieve more than we have in the past. Well, I guess maybe some people may be watching and listening and wondering where is the disconnect? If we know what we need to do, if we know that this coordination needs to take place, is it happening? Are we seeing that happen? Is it not happening fast yeah. enough? I think it's probably happening incredibly fast. The two ladies sitting to my <laughs> left and my right can give more context on that as well. Uh, we have been incredibly pleased with how much communities have been willing, willing to invest in this work and how quickly that happened. So the legislation was passed in the spring of 2012. Uh, less than a year later, we launched our first set of pilots. So 13 parishes across the state said, I'm going to start doing this work before the law tells me I have to, and in a period where I'm not even quite sure what that work is. Um, but I believe in it so much, I'm going to help you decide the future path for early childhood. And that led to the point where every community in Louisiana joined this effort before the law required it at the start of the school year. So I think the motivation is there. Uh, now we're just working through what is the best way for these communities to work together and all of these partners. What is the best structure that the state can provide to articulate how do you use the resources that you have and where do you get the support that you need? And then finally, how do we communicate publicly? Beth mentioned accountability, but how do we communicate publicly to give us all a better sense of what's going on in these places? Yeah, Teresa and Christy, can you talk a little bit about the coordination that's going on? So Agenda for Children coordinates the New Orleans Early Education Network here in New Orleans, bringing together public schools, private schools offering publicly funded seats, as well as child care centers accepting public funds and Head Start programs. So for the first time, everybody is in a room together receiving the tra same training, the same technical assistance. Um, and I think it's been really powerful for people um, to have the same criteria, the same accountability system, um, because the child care centers do work really hard. And I think it's really shown us in a lot of ways that 
in many cases, classrooms in those set settings are just as high quality as some of our LA4 classrooms. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's been really um, extraordinary opportunity for people to learn from one another and for everybody to have the same metrics so that they can see improvement. Shauna, uh, over here we have some questions and uh, one of the things that I've noticed in uh, the, the uh, pilots that we've been involved in is they're, they're very uneven. You have excellent head starts and you have head starts that aren't functioning that well and you weren't all on the same page. And so one of the things that's interesting is that we can find the best practices and then we can model them. And I have a question, questioner here outside of Baton Rouge, Karen, she's in the classroom, right? You have a question? Yes. As a kindergarten teacher for 17 years now, um, I can always tell the students who have access to quality early childhood programs and they're much more prepared to learn. How do we prior prioritize our funding so that with our funding we can make sure that every child in Louisiana has access to quality early childhood learning? So there's that question again, priority. Do we have to put early childhood ahead of some other priority? Do we have to make that hard decision? Do you feel that having to come? Or is there enough to go around? If we make the case in a strong enough fashion, what do you think, Stuart? Well, not being the one that makes the decisions down at the legislature and determines the state's budget, but um, the, uh, the Nobel Lard economist, James Heckman, says your single best place to invest is in these early years and to do otherwise is, is a waste of resources. If you put a dollar in early childhood now, in 20 years you're going to get 16, 17 percent return on investment. If you put a dollar in the stock market 20 years ago, you'd have about seven, seven dollars. So I think it's a matter of we're going to have to make some tough choices. What, what do you cut out? And I don't know that this is, you, you have to continue to educate all the children that are birthed to 18 and you need to continue to educate those that are incarcerated because they are going to get out. They are costing about $424 a day in Louisiana to be incarcerated. So if you want to run those numbers, that's about $150,000 a year for a youth that's incarcerated. Now, if we can afford that, which, which we need to do so that they have an opportunity when they get out and not be in recidivism, then we need to make some difficult choices. I'm not sure where you sacrifice that, or do you put more in the pot? With all, I, I have a lot of friends that are not in healthcare that talk about this great boom that's coming that's here that uh, Representative Leger mentioned. I think if we're going to have a workforce to support that growth in our economy, at the same time those dollars are flowing into the state, we need to redirect them and invest in those birth to five-year-olds while we continue to keep the pot whole for the five to 18 year olds. And then in 13 years, we should have a pretty good system that many people can grow up in and contribute to the workforce for all this new industry. So there's a formula called the minimum foundation formula. It funds K through 12 education. Not many people understand it, but it is the funding formula. Should, should it be opened up or does, it, does that just make your eyes roll, Walt? So I would say that, that uh, school districts across the state trust the minimum foundation formula uh, and program. So I do believe that we ought to look at inserting early childhood funds into the MFP in some fashion and asking locals to contribute for programs in their parishes, just like we do today for K through 12. Um, I would also say that part of the complication of prioritizing funding is the industrial boom and renaissance that we're seeing. What it has forced is for business interests to come to the legislature and push very aggressively for investment in workforce development and in investing in our uh, community and technical college system, which I think is a very reasonable and wise investment. Um, but when you put it up against early childhood education, it becomes very competitive because the question is, do I want the money so I can have the workforce today because it will impact my bottom line today, or am I willing to invest for the workforce of tomorrow? We shouldn't allow those two things to compete. We don't have to do one or the other. We need to do both of those things. And so as we look at tax credits across the board and as we generate revenue by re the reduction of those tax credits, we ought to be setting aside money to fund early childhood education. And I think we ought to do that through the MFP because it is a trusted source of funding protected uh, constitutionally 
and funded with a large amount of state investment, but we also ought to ask the, uh, the locals to participate. Isn't that sort of part of the problem always in Louisiana, being able to look forward beyond just the next year or the year after, being able to look, you know, 10, 15, 20 years down the line? And yes. I have something to add to that. I, I do want to make sure legislative is aware of, because I think sometimes that when you're looking at the Department of Education regs and you're looking at the ratio and you're seeing that an infant is five to one, you're seeing a two-year-old is 11 to one, you, you're looking at the budget and you're looking like, oh, they have enough of money. But the people who are really doing high quality, they're not following those state regs. They are lowering their ratios. They are decreasing how many kids are in a classroom. They're, at my facility, I have a four to one ratio. I have two teachers in each one of my classroom. I'm averaging paying 25 to $30 an hour per a teacher per classroom. These are the things that we are committed to. These are the things that we're doing, but we are not being funded for it. We're like working in a red. I mean, so I know we have plans that in 1818 and 1819 and 1820, we're gonna do this, but you have people that is doing it now, 2015, and we have some, we have been doing it since 2008. And we want them to be aware of it do we have to have the funding because we cannot continue to do this there's expectations for us it's expectation for us now we're not going to have stores we're going to have to have letter grades we're going to have to participate in class class if you are aware of what class is class is straight interaction with children there's no way there's no teacher who can work in a classroom with 11 two-year-olds i have triplet grandkids <laughs> i have them on a the weekend they're two years old and it's three of them and it's a challenge. So I can imagine 11 two-year-olds and you're talking about increasing your class scores, being able to improve language, be able to do concept development. You cannot do that with those high ratios. Okay, over to you, Shauna. I'm exhausted <laughs> just thinking about it. <laughs> it's a lot. It really is a lot. I think one of the big takeaways tonight, though, is that we need to invest in our children, but we need to invest early. That's a big takeaway tonight. And, Cindy, you have a question about that investment, right? Absolutely. I'm so glad we're talking about economic impact here because the Tulane study that's posted on our website that was done probably a decade ago said that for every dollar we spend in early childhood education, we get back a return of investment of 1.72. So that's a great return on investment. And, tell and us that your was website. a decade. It's childcarelouisiana.org. Um, I'm with the Child Care Association of Louisiana. We represent 1,500 um, members, but they're licensed child care centers and the families they serve. We were a big proponent of the school readiness tax credit and the earned income tax credit. So the question that I have tonight is um, what can we do? We hear about the Lumen budget deficit. With the governor's race going on, you hear about tax credits and sunsetting tax credits and looking at every tax credit. And I know that the Streamlining Commission looked at the school readiness tax credit and gave us an A plus and said, this is one that works. It's efficient. So we need to, we'll probably, all of them will probably be back on the table, but I would like to know what steps are being taken to preserve the school readiness tax credit and the earned income tax credit. Walt, I have to give you big kudos because you're our ch children's champion. Um, you tried to pass a bill this session to increase the state's component of the EITC, and that's critically important for working families, and we applaud you for your efforts. Thank so we'll let you start you. off with that question. Well, you know, we were successful in passing the uh, expansion of the earned income tax credit out of the House. However, uh, the Senate decided not to move forward with that proposal, and so it died on uh, the last day of session. But I suspect that we'll be back again to work on that because the economic impact is is beyond question. Um, I participated in the tax credit review uh, commission that, that, that we've done over the last couple of years. There's no question that the school readiness tax credit is one of the highest performing tax credits in the state of Louisiana. I have not heard one candidate for governor say that they want to um, do away with tax credits across the board. What they've asked for is a review of the return on investment on each of these tax credits. I think that's a wise thing to do. Um, we've certainly done some of that work. There is more work to be done. Um, but I think advocates uh, like you, advocates like the United Way team, advocates like Entergy, um, and advocates like so many of the other um, organizations that are there all the time need to be at the Capitol. Every tax credit has a constituency. 
And so the constituency of these school readiness tax credits is so broad, we just need to find the right way to maximize um, that reach. And we ought to be talking to legislators now about how important this is and the fact that it just simply can't be uh, touched. There are other areas uh, that we can certainly look at, but this isn't one of them. And Christy, I know you have just been very vocal about the tax credits. Do you want to add to that? Only thing I want to say is to make sure that the tax credit are the children is connected to the, ch the children that's going to the high quality programs. Derek? If we can, let's just like name what these tax credits do. The biggest thing they do is they allow us to pull down about $26 million of federal funding. So the state spends you know, 12 to 14 million total in these tax credits per year, but that pulls down uh, 25, 26 million dollars that goes directly into child care centers that supports child care assistance. So that, in the grand scale, is huge. On a more final, finer level, these tax credits go back to families who are enrolling their children in quality centers. So the direct investment back into the choice that families made, which ultimately can help them to some extent support the high cost of child care, is huge. The other thing that's huge is teachers and directors of child care centers who continue to improve their academic standing and earn higher credentials and have made some commitment to working in child care also get tax credits. So we keep naming that, that wages and incomes for child care teachers is an issue, and it is. The tax credits provide some support in that area. And the final, I think, key thing that it does is it provides some funding directly to our main support structure for child care. So we at the state uh, through these federal dollars, basically hire training uh, entities and training groups and coaches for child care center teachers and directors. And there's a tax credit specifically to support what they do. Uh, so if we look at the total picture, the return is not only big in terms of federal matching dollars, but the actual impact it makes in a classroom in a center is huge. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. Beth. And I think that there are a specific, there are nonprofits that are selected in different parts of the state to do this training. I know in the Baton Rouge area, I think it's Volunteers of America. And uh, one of the things that they to have told me is that they had to really go out and aggressively market to tell people about these tax credits. So part of the challenge is you have things on the books, but if people, if you don't have a marketing budget, then people don't know about them is a problem. But here's a teacher who knows a lot about early childhood. What's your question? Hi, good evening. My name's Danielle and my question is, how can we ensure that there is a system in place that provides for accountability and a high quality of care with providers so that we can provide real improvement in the quality of care and learning for our youngest scholars? So you're talking about a system of accountability. Who wants to take that? That one. <laughs> the this department has been fascinating. Just... So in the original legislation, there was literally four words that said we had to have a uniform assessment and accountability system. Uh, so that sort of assessment and accountability system has resulted in a lot of what we're focusing on with these centers throughout the state, with these schools, and with these Head Starts. So for the first time in Louisiana, and I believe for the first time in the nation, we as a state truly have a uniform system where we are gauging quality the same way in childcare as we are in Head Start and as we are in our public and non-public preschool programs. And that is around, as Christy said earlier, how are teachers interacting with children? And we use an observation tool called the Classroom Assessment Scoring System to get at that, which is a nationally researched and highly regarded tool. But we will be able to produce performance ratings for each of these locations throughout the state, which gives us a consistent and comparative way to say how are folks doing, and more importantly, how do we need to provide support so we can do better in the future? So I remember when my daughter was very young, I would go around to all the various child care centers and observe myself. But what you're going to be able to do now is will we post online, perhaps, or let people know so if you're a parent, you'll be able to judge Absolutely. So very similar to the way that we all know about school performance and letter grades, we will have a cycle that gets very public to where anyone in the community can say, okay, how is this child care center or how is this school performing? Uh, right now, we are doing that on three levels. So you'll know, are they excellent, are they proficient, or do they need to improve? Thank you. Shauna? 
Uh, well, we have come to the end of the show. It's been so informative. We've learned a lot. We thank you all so very much for all of the information. It's an important issue. It's a big problem. There are a lot of parts to it. We know that there are some strides uh, that have been made, but certainly more work needs to be done. So we thank you all so very much uh, for your time. Our panel, uh, Walt Leger, thank you very much uh, for being here with us tonight. Christy Reddick Givens, uh, Derek Little, Teresa Fowler, and of course, Dr. Stuart Gordon. Thank you all so very much for your insight tonight. And we would love to get your comments as well. We invite you to go to lpb.org uh, slash public square, and there you can check out extended interview clips and additional resources on this topic, including where the candidates for governor and for our state's top school board, Bessie, the Board of Elementary and Secondary, Secondary Education, stand on this issue. So please take some time and visit us online, Beth. Well, Shauna, and you can watch uh, LPB's debate because we asked the candidates about early childhood. And so on, up online is our debate as well, lpb.org. And I would say, as we close out this evening, I want to thank everyone in the audience. Again, thank the panelists, but thank all of you all for caring about early childhood. You know, we spend eight hours a day with early childhood programming on public broadcasting, so we're with you in trying to make children ready to learn. And we thank the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts for hosting us this evening. Thank all of you for joining us. Good night. Thanks. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org. This program was made possible in part by funding from Entergy, supporting the future of our communities through investments in early childhood education. Information available at Entergy.com. Entergy, together we power life. This program is part of American Graduate. Let's make it happen. A public media initiative made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and from viewers like you.